thank, thank you again, Margot, to you and the committee for the uh, invitation to speak uh, today. It's a wonderful opportunity of uh, meeting the swimming fraternity again. Um, I've been given 20 minutes to talk about Paralympic swimming sports medicine. And uh, what is very interesting, if you have a look at any of the books on sports medicine, uh, they kind of say that whatever happens in the able bodies happen exactly the same in the Paralympics. And what I'm here to tell you about in this 20 minute section is that that's not true. And I'm going to show you some of the data. So I'd like to acknowledge the IFC Research Centre's grant, which uh, has funded a lot of the work that I'm going to be speaking about this morning. So Paralympic swimming started in 1960. Uh, as opposed to athletics, uh, you're not allowed to use any prostheses in the pool. The athlete can enter the water in different ways, and it caters for um, uh, athletes with a whole range of diverse impairments. Their physical impairments, of which there are 10 classes, uh, labeled S1 to S10. Uh, the lower numbers, S1, are the more severe impairments compared to S10. Then there are visually impaired athletes, which are S11 to 13, more visually impaired being the lower numbers. There's intellectual impairment. The um, intellectually impaired athletes have uh, problems with pacing and reaction to uh, starts and finishes, and also pattern recognition, and they labeled S14. Uh, S indicates uh, freestyle, butterfly, and, and backstroke, and SM uh, would indicate the, the uh, medley, whereas SB is the breaststroke. So, um, you should also know that um, Paralympic swimming is quite controversial at the moment because there are at present a lot of allegations of something that we call uh, intentional misrepresentation or blatantly called cheating and this is something that's under scrutiny by the International Paralympic Committee at the moment. So if one talks about sports medicine and you talk about injuries and illnesses, uh, one cannot but help speak about Lord Barr's um, method of talking about for an injury or an illness to occur we need a predisposed athlete and then we get exposure to other risk factors and then you get a susceptible athlete and then you get an inciting event and that inciting event leads to the injury or the illness. Now the internal risk factors or the intrinsic risk factors for general swimmers would be things like age, gender, body composition, health, physical fitness, anatomy and skill level. But when we're going to talk about the Paralympic swimmer, you're going to look at 10 different other conditions. And these are the ones of impaired muscle power, impaired passive range of motion, a limb deficiency, a difference in leg length, short of stature, then the movement disorders, hypotonia, ataxia and atletosis, which are typical of athletes with cerebral palsy, vision impairment and intellectual impairment. And those 10 conditions really feed into this first box of intrinsic risk factors. So this group of athletes are coming to the party with intrinsic risk factors that really can't be modified. And what I'm going to speak about is does taking those 10 conditions in make them predisposed to injuries and illnesses. So you've heard about various talks this morning that have looked at various different intervention strategies. And you're also aware, yesterday I've spoken about the Willem van Mechelen's model, whereby one goes and looks at the epidemiology, and once you've got a baseline, then you can start looking for risk factors and interventions. Well, in Paralympic sports medicine, we're still in box number one. We're still setting the basis of gathering our data, only in certain sports like football fives have we started doing various different interventions. So we've used London, Sochi, Rio and going to use Pyeongchang for actually collection of our baseline data before we're going to start many of the various different interventions. This is our research group that's uh, spearheaded by Stellenbosch and Pretoria University in South Africa, also Harvard University, other universities in Canada and in uh, the United Kingdom and we've done a number of different studies now using quite sophisticated technology where there's a web-based system of collection of injury and illness data from various of the team physicians that look after athletes and predominantly this is recorded from in a longitudinal fashion from one game's time to another. 
This is looking at some of the first data. I'm going to spend eight minutes working about injuries and eight minutes speaking about illnesses. These are some of the data that we published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine looking at uh, injury proportion and injury rates. Injury proportion is the percentage of athletes who are injured out of our big cohort and the injury rates of injuries per thousand athlete days for Summer Olympics, Summer Paralympics and Winter Paralympics. And what you can see by these figures in front of you is that the Paralympic Games is more dangerous from an illness, from an injury perspective. So if you look at Summer Olympics and some Paralympics, more in injuries in the Paralympic athletes. And if you've got a kid who's actually participating in the Winter Paralympics, it then becomes a problem because you can see double the incidence of injury in the Winter Paralympic sports. So let's get back to the summer sports now because this is where swimming fits in. And this is looking at the injuries per thousand athlete days and the 95% confidence intervals. With a, if you look on the far left of this graph, you will see that bar of all the average of all injuries. So where does swimming fit in with all these different sports? Well, I'm very happy to say that swimming is a low-risk sport at the Paralympic level for injuries. Um, our studies aren't the only ones. The Brazilians have done some studies looking at injuries in visually disabled athletes and visually disabled swimmers. And they found that there's a greater incidence of injury in the more severely impaired swimmers as well. And to the best of my knowledge, those are really the only studies that actually exist. So let's delve down into those data in a little bit more detail. So again, I'm going to start by comparing the London Paralympics, the London Olympics, and uh, Astrid Jung's data from the Beijing 2008 Summer Olympics. And if you have a look at the red boxes there, that is describing the ratio of upper limb injuries to lower limb injuries. In the Olympic athletes, it's by far more the lower limb injuries that predominate. But when we have a look at the Paralympians, they have an inverse relationship of upper limb to lower limb injuries, much higher upper limb injuries. And when we have a look at which injuries these are, in the upper limb, it's by far the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist, of, the wrist and hand. And in fact, these shoulder injuries are actually not so benign within the Paralympic uh, cohort. 50% of the shoulder injuries actually end competition or force the athlete to withdraw out of competition, where only 10% of wrist and uh, hand and elbow injuries cause them to leave the competition. The shoulder and um, elbow and hand injuries are much more in males compared with females. And there is an increasing trend in the age category, showing that as you get older, there's an increased incidence of shoulder injuries. Remember that the Paralympic cohort is on average 10 years older than the Olympic cohort. There's also an increased incidence in the shoulder injuries in the, of chronic nature and acute upon chronic nature, so that the, really the chronicity and athletes going into the game setting with chronic injuries is something that needs to be addressed. Wrist and hand, however, are acute injuries. And the team physicians usually report that the majority of the pathology is rotator cuff impingement. But again, which are the sports that are most involved? And here swimming does feature quite predominantly. Powerlifting by far is the highest risk sport closely followed by judo and then swimming. Um, and the wrist and hand, we find goalball and wheelchair basketball being the two sports that are most important there. So the risk of upper limb injury is about 72%, uh, 7 comma 2%, that's uh, how many athletes out of 100 will get injured. Shoulder injuries are the most common, the risk factors of being over 35 years old, male, and swimming features in that. So this is where we need to actually start tailoring our prevention programs when we're going to start instituting those. So I want to speak briefly about illness. And again, we see a very similar uh, uh, data curve here when we look at the Summer Olympics, Summer Paralympics, Winter Paralympics, and Winter Olympics, showing that for illnesses, there is a higher illness rate and illness proportion in Paralympic athletes compared to their Olympic counterparts. So where does swimming fit into the illness rate? Well, I'm happy to report again that that's pretty middle of the field. 
So it isn't targeted as a high-risk illness sport, although there are some caveats uh, to that. The profile in the Paralympic athlete of illnesses is also different to that of the Olympic athlete. Number one, you see the lower red box there is respiratory illness. That's the same in Olympic or, or Paralympic athletes. And if we know how to prevent respiratory problems and respiratory illnesses, then as team physicians, we are going to be getting more than 60% of the problems that we deal with on a tour. And my next talk before lunchtime is going to deal with measures to prevent respiratory problems. But in the Paralympic athletes, we have other different medical issues, the so-called non-respiratory conditions. And these are skin and subcutaneous tissues which come to the fore, as well as urogenital and digestive system problems. So we were able to drill down on 385 illnesses and get a better idea of what it is that we're actually looking at with the Paralympic athletes. So the first important take-home message is that when we ask the team physicians what the main problems are, are these existing conditions, are these environmental conditions, or are these infections, infections comes up as the main predominant uh, cause of all illness. The groups of Paralympic athletes with these problems are predominantly those with spinal cord injuries and amputation limb deficiency followed by visually impaired athletes. And in fact, the athletes with cerebral palsy seem, seem somehow protected from these uh, illnesses. So let's take a closer look at the skin and subcutaneous uh, illnesses. And these happen specifically in spinal cord injury and amputation and limb deficient. So how severe are these? And the answer is, is that 80% of them, you do not do, they're not time loss illnesses. But 20% are either one day lost or more than one day lost. So that's a large amount to consider. But the, the really interesting finding that we have is when the athletes present to the doctor, and if you have a look at the column of all illnesses, you'll see that although 70% present on the same day, there's 30% that present a day or more than a day later. And this was very interesting to us because we thought, was this something Paralympic? Paralympic athletes are used to looking after their own problems. Self-care is much more evident in this community. But then we found out that you've got doctors all over. And um, the other thing is that their symptoms are very different. The symptoms are subtle. A Paralympic athlete with spinal cord injury doesn't know when they've got a urinary tract infection. They have no dysuria. They have no burning. All they know is they feel off color and they come and say to your doc, I think I've got a urinary tract infection. And then you start intervening. But have a look again at respiratory illnesses. Respiratory illnesses, they're 30% of them that are reporting after a day. You've missed your window of opportunity of isolating that athlete and stopping that spread going through the entire team. The other problem is for particularly athletes with amputation, the stump socket interface. Now when you've got a stump, and you've got a socket, that's where technology meets the human body. And that's a very different area. You know, we've got hard skin on the sole of our feet. Now what you're doing is you're taking the skin of either the popliteal fossa or the thigh, and you're saying, buddy, that's your skin that you're going to interface with your socket with. And that socket is a closed area, it's hot in there, it's humid in there, and you've got all kinds of bugs from the just freshly swam environment where you towel dry and then get into your liner again and go and put into uh, the socket. So this is an area of potential breakdown that needs to be looked at. I also want to show you something really interesting. This is one of our sprinting athletes in our laboratory, sprinting in a biomechanics lab over a force plate. And here you see the forces and have a look on your right hand side. That right hand force there that you show there's the arrow, as that force goes down, that's with the prosthetic side. But the other side is, because of the prosthesis, this is the sound side, his normal leg, takes double the forces going down compared to the prosthetic side. And you would think that it's the prosthesis in that area that has all the problems. As far as injuries go, it's the other side, it's the sound side that breaks down most. So what do you find in somebody who's got a typical one leg below knee amputation? This athlete, medial tibial stress syndrome on the sound leg, he's got overlap, overloading of the contralateral facet joint of L5, 
Emily's got, because of the kinetic change, shoulder pain as well. So from a single bemoaning amplitude, you can have very different, vast, remote problems that you need to consider. And air travel presents a very big problem for these athletes. You know that stump changes size and fluctuates between 10 and 30 percent just over a flying. And now you get out of your flying and you've got to get into that socket and that causes problems. So to leave you with some practical advice for skin care, if you're looking after athletes who have got stumps, the skin lesions, however small, are very, very important. They accelerate very rapidly into big problems. A minor irritation equals a potential danger. Treat them early, continue watching them, and whatever happens, don't think they're going to heal on their own accord. And also, skin is the most important barrier. This here, this little pimple that you might think you might think that that's an, a trivial condition. That is what we call the stress fracture of the amputee. Because if you take a needle and you lance that, you keep them out of competition for two weeks. Yes, you can put a ti titanium impregnated plaster on that and think that you've got a waterproof seal in the water. But that athlete is going to get an infection and that is going to cause a big problem. Also be aware that athletes get into a games environment and they don't behave like they behave at home. Brendan Burkett from Australia did this study where he looked at how many steps do athletes with amputation take in the game setting. And he found that they take an additional 5,472 steps as an amputee when they are in a competition environment. Now those of us who are watching our physical activity monitor know how hard it is just to get 5,472 steps. So these guys are using that for a long, long time and just be aware and guide and educate your athletes not to walk a lot if they want to be swimming the best that they can. So my take home messages are that athletes with impairment might be more vulnerable to illness and injury by nature of their underlying impairment. Illnesses are common in Paralympic athletes. There is a high incidence of about 20% of time loss illnesses. The spectrum of illnesses is different. There's an emphasis on the non-respiratory illnesses. The most common of those are uh, skin and urinary tract infections. The spinal injured and the amputees are your athletes that are at the highest risk and most of those are infections. And the athletes, especially those with spinal cord injuries, present with not the usual but vague symptoms to have a high index of suspicion. Swimming is a low-risk sport for injury. The shoulder, as in able-bodied uh, swimmers, is the most common, and that is where prevention programs of the future need to be tailored. Thank you very much for your attention.